So we, our, our ministry is birthed out of Isaiah 61. And that's, that's where I'm going to start this morning. Isaiah 61. I'm going to read a couple verses here. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release of dark, from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a sign or a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And it does go on and on talking about how the Lord <clears throat> desires to bless and, and desires to make his people shine. And um, our hearts as, as a church, as, as a ministry, uh, really is people. Um, the first core value is people, and it's all about him. <clears throat> so the core values here are people, that we have people, presence, is in the presence of God, the pursuit of his face and character, the practicality of God, discipleship, and destiny. Those are our core values. Why are they important? You know, what is it so important about having core values? Um, you know, because... You know, you got you got to look at the definition to understand what they are. And core, the core value definition is the values we hold, which form the foundation on which we perform work and conduct ourselves. So, as as a church, if we don't know the values that that cause us to do what we do, and cause us to conduct ourselves in the way we conduct ourselves, then we're lost, and we're basically just a fellowship of people kind of wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. And really, I really felt like the Lord wanted me to do this that we get the direction and go forward. Um, what, what you saw in that video, my heart is someday to be able to do things like that. My heart is to be able to, to reach out in, in different facets of different communities and, and society. Um, so why are they important to us? Well, they give us the heartbeat of God for the work that he intends for us to do in this church and as his church on the whole. The work is intended to start in four walls and end in the open community. I think for so long, the church has had a lot of vision. And at, at the church as a whole, I don't mean this, I mean church as a whole, has been, they love the idea of getting together in the four walls. I mean, we love to get together and worship and we love to get together and fellowship. The problem is it usually ends there. And we'll leave it up to separate entities or ministries or different government agencies or whatever to kind of take care of the community or to do these things and to have an emphasis on people. And then we wonder why people hate the church or don't want anything to do with the church. And I believe God wants to turn that around. And the first and foremost reason is because it's all about him. It's all about him. And the reason I say that is because his heart is for people. If you read Isaiah 61 and you really look at it closely, you understand the heart of God and who it's for. Yes, it's for the healthy, but who did Jesus say he came to save? Not only the lost, but he came for who? The, the, health, the, the, the sick. He said the healthy don't need a doctor. It's the sick that need a doctor. And the church kind of plays doctor, right? We play doctor to the world where we have an answer. We have, we have the cure for what ails them. And we need to understand that cure in order to go out and bring it to the lost. And we can't necessarily expect them to come to us. We've got to be willing to go to them. And we've got to be willing to go to them in various ways, and, I'll, and we'll go over that in a little bit. Now, the, as to the, the how, when we're talking about this core value and how we do this, how we get in the four walls and how we go out into the community and how we do these things, those are things that Sandy and I have vision for, but those are also things that we need your input. For those of you who are going to be attending here, those of you who are going to come to church, we need your input <coughs> as to the how for a lot of these things. Because, you know, God has given different ones of you different passions and different visions to do things. And we want to know what your heart is. Because we not only want to bug you in, but we want to kick you out of the nest and, and force you to do it. Not force you, that's a bad word. We want to see you do it. Because the whole point is, you're not meant to take up space and, and warm up a seat on Sunday mornings. You're meant to come in, mature, 
spread your wings, and fly. Because when you fly, other people learn to fly. I'm reminded of a story of, you got, a, you got an eagle who lives with turkeys, okay? And those of you who have seen turkeys know that turkeys don't fly. So you got an eagle who walks around with the turkeys. And he's just walking around and he's just like, yeah, you know, and someone comes by and says, why aren't you flying? He's like, I don't fly. Uh, don't you know who you are? No, I'm, I'm a turkey. I, turkeys don't fly. And the turkey, or the rest of the turkeys were around, just walking around like, yeah, we don't fly. And it had to come to a point where this outside, what are you call animal, had to convince this eagle, do you understand who you are? You were meant to fly. You were not meant to be grounded. You were not meant to walk with the turkeys. And there came a point where that eagle was forced into a flight. And once he spread his wings open and realized he could soar, he was no longer bound and restricted to the ground any longer. He was able to lift with his wings and soar over problems, soar over things, and he became an example for the turkeys. And I would venture to say that in that group of turkeys there were other eagles who thought they were turkeys. And how many times as Christians do we think that we're turkeys? And we think we're stuck and we're bound to this thing. We're, we're, we're destined to sit in a pew or in a seat and warm it for 50, 60, 70 years until we die. And that's God's purpose for us. We're meant to warm the pew. And there comes a point at which, whether it's me or someone else in your life says, do you realize you've got wings? And sometimes we're reluctant to say, oh, I really don't, I can't do that. I don't want to do it. And sometimes it takes someone, in a, and I'll put the word encouragement, to kind of give you a little nudge. And you fall out of the nest and you're like, are you kidding me? I'm going to die. And then all of a sudden you're forced to open your wings and you're like, wow, I'm better than I thought I was. Not in a prideful way, but wow, God made me for more than this. It's all about him. Secondly, this church is about us. It wouldn't be a church if it wasn't about us too. So Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 says this. It was he, meaning Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole me measure of the fullness of Christ. Meaning that for so often... The pastors of us, the, the pastors and teachers and the evangelists, people look at them and they're like, it's their responsibility to get the work done. How many of you ever heard that? You read in a church where someone's like, oh, you need to do this. And they're like, oh, no, no, that's the pastor's responsibility. Oh, that's so-and-so's responsibility. And it's not. It's all of ours. We're all called to be leaders in some way. But there are fivefold ministry gifts here that Jesus has given to the body. And the purpose of these gifts as Paul describes, is to first of all prepare God's people for works of service. Why? So that the body of Christ can be built up. The body of Christ can't be built unless people are trained to serve. And they're not trained to serve unless people who have the giftings understand them and grow up. But they're all meant so that we can all reach the unity, there's a unity in the faith that we have, in the knowledge of Christ. But that the most important thing is that we become mature and perfect, as the Bible says. And perfect just means completely mature in the fullness of Christ. What would the church look like in the fullness of Christ? How awesome would that be to have a mature bride? People that are not offended by little tiny details of things. People that are not easily like, oh, well, I'm leaving your church now. You said this to me. I'm offended. I'm out of here. I'm taking me, my family, my tithe, and we're out. And believe me, I've been around enough churches to know that there are people that pull these things. And that's, that's not godliness. That's control. And that has no place in the body of Christ. And we've put up with it for so long. Because we've not been healthy as a church. And I'm not saying, oh, well, this church is going to be the most healthy. There are many healthy churches out there. So we're not going to be attaining to be the only one. There are many healthy churches 
But what I'm saying is the I-61 church, we're gonna grow, we want to grow people up. We want to mentor people. And mentorship is a big issue that we're going to focus on as we go forward. We want to equip you. We want you to, the light bulb to go on in your head and be like, oh, wow, I'm capable of this, 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 and this. Wow. Then once you're equipped and you have that light bulb go off, we want to enable you to do it. And by enabling you to do it, we want you and us together to bring the revelation of God into your circumstance or into what you're doing. The whole point of all of this is that the kingdom of God is established, period. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about this church. It's not about us becoming a 50 million member church and being like, hey, we're awesome. If we did that and the kingdom of God was not established through us, then we're nothing. It's all about the kingdom of God through us. The heartbeat of this ministry is that we disciple, equip, strengthen, and grow up every believer into their potential and destiny for their lives. You see, destiny is a big word, and it is more of a future thing. The problem is a lot of us understand we have a destiny, but we don't want to get there, or we don't want to take the steps to get there. We don't want to grow up. We don't want to get mature. You know, the mentorship thing is huge. The mentorship thing allows you to have someone over you that can say, ah, I'm seeing something here. You need to grow up here. You're doing awesome here. This is awesome. Keep doing this. Yeah, cheer me on. And then someone who, when you're having a hard time, a shoulder to cry, and we're all meant to do that, but someone in specific that knows your dirty little details. Someone that knows you and that's not going to judge you, but that's going to build you up. And unfortunately, the church, that has also been a lost art. Paul writes in Timothy, and he talks about having the elders, the older men and women over you, mentoring and teaching and enabling the younger. And it's not just because we grow up in Christ, but it's also because, think about it, look at society today. If the younger people of us, my generation and a lot of your generation younger, if we look to our parents and our grandparents and we listen to what they said and we follow it, where would our society be today? Probably a lot more healthy. But unfortunately, we've decided to say, forget all of you, we know the better way. We decided to throw off the mentoring. We don't, we don't care about fathers and mothers anymore. We don't care about respecting people. We don't care about respecting elders. It's all about us. Me, me, me. I'm doing it my way. And in our country today, it's all about we've got these personal freedoms. It's all about me. So when someone comes up to you and in a way gets in your face and says, Hey, I want to encourage you. You need to do this better. Who do you think you are? Get out of my face. I don't have to listen to you. Right? And so no one ever grows up into the maturity of Christ. And those people end up leaders someday. And they run unhealthy ministries or churches. And I believe God wants us to come to a place of maturity. And as we come to a place of maturity, we function together. And then what happens is, then you have someone in a different denomination that may believe a little differently than you. But you believe in the same Lord. And you're able to get along with them. And you're not butt heads with each other because you love each other. And because there's a maturity in your faith that allows you to work together and allow God to do what God's going to do. And then we don't have to force, you know, you got someone who's doing something, you're like, oh, you got to believe this. And they're like, yeah, well, I don't. But if you would back off and just say, you know what, let's, let's work together. Let's be mature about this and allow God and his sovereignty to work this out. You would be amazed. I mean, talking with some of you after last week, seeing how people from like, Many, many different nominations are coming together. Your generation, the younger generation, just getting together to worship. And things are happening. You've got evangelical. You've got Episcopal. You've got some, you know, really hardline, you know, denomination people. You've got some Pentecostals. And all getting together and the mix is becoming explosive. And not in a bad way like we're used to. We're seeing people say, hey, I just want God. And they get together and things are just boom. And pretty soon you're going to see the power of God exhibited in such a way that it's almost going to be like an open heaven. I mean, we're going to just blast through the glass ceiling that's been over us for years. But it comes through a maturing. And it's important to have the maturity. And it's important to understand. Look, I, I have at least four people over me that have the right to speak directly into my life. And if they tell me I'm doing something wrong, they have the right to tell me I'm doing something wrong, and I'm going to have to change it. Because I'm a firm believer that you can never lead unless you're willing to follow first. The ultimate goal of this church 
is to see you find, as in you, find God's vision for you and walk in it. Because ultimately, when you see the vision that God has given your life, it becomes something that blesses this ministry, blesses this church. And when you have all these things functioning together, you've got something healthy. Because some of you may have come from a very broken situation that I don't understand. I can in some way, but I'm not going to be able to minister to people like that that you will. Maybe you have a heart for missions and to see you know, people of foreign cultures, even if they move here, see them minister to. Maybe that's more of a missions heart than I would have. We need that too. We need people that have that heartbeat of God functioning and alive. So that way when they say, hey, I've got something going on that I, you know, we, I need help, we, we, we want to get this done, that as a church, our heartbeat says, hey, let's connect with you, let's do this. Maybe there's some of you who want to, you know, we've, we've discussed starting food and clothing pantries. Maybe someone who, you know, you get involved and you get connected with that, that this church connects with that and that it becomes something that draws people that we couldn't on our own draw. We need each other. And lastly, it's about them, as in the people that are not in the four walls. It's what I would call the whomsoever shall from a very famous Bible verse. Probably one of the most famous of all times in John 3.16. The who are widows, orphans, the oppressed, the ungodly. Basically the hurt, whomever. Whomever will come to him. James 1.27 says that a, a pure and undefiled religion is this, to take care of the widows and the orphans. And it talks about loving God after that, but God's heartbeat is widows and orphans. That throughout the scriptures you will read, he is very strong, and he act, there are very strong words he has for those who abandon the widow in their need and abandon the orphan. Very strong words God has for them. I believe it's very important that as a church that that's not the only focus, but that it's a very strong focus. I will tell you from dealing with it firsthand, losing a father is a very strong issue, a very big issue. And the unfortunate thing is that the church as a whole tends to, you know, we tend to focus on people for the first maybe week, couple weeks where they're the flavor of the moment because something tragic just happened. But then what happens three months, six months down the road when maybe the mother is forced on welfare or they have nothing and they're living in a shack? And we as a church are just like, hey, glory to God, glory to God. And they're still suffering. And they're coming to church. And maybe they got a smile on their face, but deep inside they are destroyed. Where are we for them? Who can we be for them? I, I realize that all of us have struggles in our lives, so it's not like we can say, we're going to just buy them a house and buy them a brand new car. We're gonna... Because there are those of us who don't have those things. But could we set up meal structures for them? Could we take them out? Maybe different people take them out once a week and get groceries for them. Could we help them get gas in their car? Maybe help them get training so they, that they could get a job. Maybe single mother, single father, help them get jobs. Just, just little ideas, things like that, in a practical sense. The oppressed. I mean, how many people have gone through, I mean, you've got drug addicts and alcoholics and people that are addicted to smoking even, and things like that, that they're just so addicted to, things that they're oppressed by. How can we minister to them? How can we love them? How can we say, you know, it's okay if you smoke on our front porch. You can't come in and smoke, but it's okay if you come in there. It's okay if you come in drunk. It's okay if you come in high. It's okay. How can we better minister to those people? How can we love those people? And the ungodly. In John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whomsoever shall believe in him will not perish but, but have everlasting life. Our call is to all of these people, and I'm sure there are many, many more that we could have examples of and say, hey, you know, don't forget about this group or that group. There, I'm sure there are many more. But what I'm saying is we're called to these people. Isaiah 61 talks about the oppressed. Matthew 16 talks about the ungodly. And James 127 talks about widows and orphans. And those are just a few scriptures that would focus on this group of people. But if we look at Jesus' life and the way he lived, who did he hang out with? I mean, he had his 12 around him and he had his followers, but who, who did he hang with every day? 
He hung with the down and outers, the oppressed. He hung out with people that were sick. He hung out with lepers. People whose body parts were falling off of them because their body, their flesh was getting eaten away. He hung out with them. And then he would walk up to them and say, hey, by the way, all of you, you're cool. Get up and take off. You're good. And all of a sudden, body parts would pop back on, things, scales would fall off, and they'd be like, oh my gosh. And then he would say, by the way, don't say anything to anybody about this. I don't want word getting out. And then guess what they did? They would run so excited. I mean, they'd be like, oh my gosh, are you serious? I got my fingers back? Oh my gosh. They'd be, boom, next town. So by the time Jesus gets there, the second he walks into town, he's got a crowd. And people are like, you're the guy. He didn't even need his own PR firm. The people he healed ran to the next town, and those people ran to the next town, and before you know it, wherever he went, he had a crowd without even speaking a word because there were people who already heard in the town before. What he did preceded him. Could that be said eventually? Could that be said of our church? Could what we do precede us? Could what we do be such an impact on the community and on people's lives that when we go somewhere, they're like, we already know about you. How cool would that be to walk into a situation and have people say, I know about your church. You guys are awesome. We want you here. How cool would it be to have phones ringing off end of ours or our church phone, phones ringing up. Hey, we hear you're doing this. Could you come? We know you guys are awesome. We need you here. How cool would it be to have secular organizations saying, we need you. Even other Christian organizations, we need to partner with you. That, I believe, is what God's heartbeat and I, as you look at Jesus' life, as, as it's written in the Gospels, now, I, I, obviously I wasn't there, so I don't know exactly what happened day by day, but if you look through the Gospels, and you look at the percentage of time Jesus spent in church, as opposed to the time he spent outside the four walls, it's no contest. Not even close. Very rarely does it talk about him being in church, as opposed to how often it's talked about him being in with the multitudes and him being out. And then when he was with the multitudes, he fed them. Not just spiritually, he fed them physically. He ministered to their needs. He healed them. He fed them. I mean, how cool would that be to have an outreach where you're not really preaching necessarily, but all of a sudden, you're feeding people and people are getting healed. Do you really think you'll ever need to preach ever again, at least for the next little bit of time? I mean, people are going to be like, oh my gosh. They'll be on their cell phones, texting. Oh my gosh, you'll never believe what happened. Oh my gosh, do you hear this? And before you know it, You'll have people saying, we want a part of what's going on. And the important part after that would be, once the net is full of fish, to learn how to disciple them. And to actually assimilate them properly, not just let them sit in a pew and rot for ten years and eventually be like, yeah, I'm a Christian and they're still doing out the same things that they used to. To really make it a focus to disciple them and grow them up. Because ultimately, ultimately the goal of our ministry is to send you out. And some of you may be sent out and never come back. You may be sent out and do missions, and you, you may be out gone, the Lord may send you to missions. Some of you may, God may call to start your own churches. That's more than fine with us. That's awesome. Obviously, as long as it's done in the healthy and right way, that's awesome. We want that. We want to see each and every person grow. So the how here, and I did talk about this, is through worship, through our worship service. We want to have a very relevant an impactful worship service that has a defined purpose. So as we grow and as, as we start, and you know, in the beginning as we're as a core and as we're starting to function, it's going to be a little different. But ultimately as we're going forward, the Sunday morning church service may be more basic, may be more simple, may be more of, hey, why don't you bring friends? Why don't you bring people that need to know Jesus? And then maybe we'll have another night where we focus, if we really want to get deep into worship and prayer and really want to disciple and get really into the, the, the meat of the word, then maybe that'll be a night where we do that. I'm a firm believer in defined purpose for what you're doing. Otherwise, it's just a jumbled mess and nobody gets anything out of it. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and my, my goal is that ultimately <clears throat> we have worship services that reflect God's heart for what we're doing. And another thing, the how, is outreach. I, wanted, I would like to be able to do both evangel evangelistic and practical. <coughs> There will be times where maybe we're going to put out, we're going to go into a park and do a skit because we want to have people respond. We want to see people come to salvation. And there may be times where, as God provides, we run out a park and we do what they did and we give out freebies just because. 
We're not going to preach to them. We'll offer prayer if they want prayer, but we're not going to be like, hey, we're going to do this and this and this. We're just going to love on them and show them Christ's love. And in doing so, we will outreach. We want to focus on fellowship. Because how will you know the needs unless you're connected with people? Unless you're actually connected with people, how would you know if the person next to you is really hurting? How would you know? I mean, it's hard because sometimes people are hurting and they hide it well. They smile and they go home to no food on the table. But you wouldn't know that unless you were in fellowship with them. And then you'll really get to know their needs. And I'm not saying that it's up to you necessarily to do it. And if God calls you to, then do it. But I'm saying at church, we get to know we get to know each other and know their needs. On top of that, we get to know people that are not in the church. We get to know their needs and we begin to supply and help them out. And I know Benny Hinn kind of touched on this when he was here, but any covenant that there was made was sealed with fellowship. Any covenant was sealed with fellowship. In, very, in particular, the Last Supper. Jesus was making covenant with his disciples. So what did he do? He sat down and had a meal with them. Covenant every single time was sealed with a meal, specifically. Because what better way I mean, in the, covenant, in the covenant ritual, blood was always required. So you ever see those old movies where they would slit their wrist and put their wrists together and, you know, my blood is your blood. We're family now. You ever see those movies? Okay, that's what, that's what covenant would do. They would bind their hands together with blood and th their blood would mingle, meaning my life is yours, yours is mine. We are covenant brothers now, covenant sisters, whatever. And then what would happen is to seal it would be a meal, meaning, look, we've sealed our lives together. But now I'm going to give you, my, out of my sustenance, my food, I'm going to give you all that I am. Everything that I am and everything I have now is yours. And everything that you have is now mine. We are now covenanted together. And by that I don't mean, that means that they get to walk over to the other person's house and say, party tonight, huh? And then all of a sudden they're like, uh, no, we got my family coming over. No, you said what mine is yours. It doesn't mean that way. There's obviously respect and honor that goes with that. But, it's important to have that fellowship and that covenant with one another. And I'm not saying covenant, we need to split our wrists together. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about covenant in the faith where we break bread together. I'll call it fellowship with a purpose. Let's do it Jesus style. Let's fellowship Jesus style. Okay? How many of you remember the story of Zacchaeus? You ever grow up with that song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he? Okay, maybe I'm dating myself here. <laughs> but Zacchaeus was a very short man, but a very sinful man. Okay, And he wanted to meet Jesus, so he hid up in a tree, so he could be high enough to see him. And Jesus saw him as he was walking down the road, and was like, hey, what are you doing up there? Well, I just wanted to see you. He's like, come on down here. This man was dirty. Okay, He was, he was, a, he was a sinful man. And what was Jesus' response to him? Hey, I'm going to go to your house. Let's go have some fellowship. Let's go have some food. Let's, fell let's have some fun. Now, I'm sure his disciples' jaws all hit the ground at the same time, like, oh my gosh, are you serious? Do you know who this is? But the point was made. I'm here for him. You already have me. I'm here for him. And so that is what I feel like would be us. The people that are unnoticed. The people that are hiding in trees because they want to view but no one sees them, and they feel like they're nobodies. I want those people. Because you get someone like that, and you plug them in, you disciple, you disciple them, and you mentor them, man, they got rocket fuel, and they just take off. They're just, boom, they're out of here. I don't mean out of this fellowship. I mean, they, they're people that you plug in, they're just, they're going. You could ask them to do anything, and they're like, oh my gosh, I'll clean your toilet. Seriously, because there are people like that, they get so impassioned, they just want to serve God. So, Why? It's about them. Why? Well, first of all, because God loves them. So should we. God does not condemn them. Neither should we. God is passionate about their future. So should we. Jeremiah 29, 11. It's a very famous verse. You know, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to, you know, not to harm you, and plans to give you hope in the future. Do you realize who he was writing that to? He was writing it to Israel. During a time of captivity. During a time where God purposefully allowed them to get captured because of their sin. Because of how much they disgusted him. 
he wrote this to them. And then at, at verses 5, he talks about how he's going to bless them and bring them out and do these amazing things. But isn't it awesome, if you look at this passage, that it's all about a sinful Israel in captivity and God's promise for their future. How God looked at them and didn't see their sin at the moment and said, look, I, that's already, I'm already past that. I'm past my anger. I'm going to tell you that you have a hope and you have a future. I have awesome things in the future for you. And this was about a people that willingly, knowingly turned their back on God and sinned. A people that made God ticked off. Because they had his blessing. He brought them through the Red Sea. He fed them through manna. He, he did all these amazing things. And they still kept doing this. And then he tells them, look, I'm done being angry with you. I have this awesome stuff for you. So if he's going to tell that to Israel, this purposeful, sinful nation, imagine what he wants to do for the lost of today that are in sin and ignorance. People that may not know Christ, they may know a little bit about him, but they've never had communion with him. They've never fellowshiped with God. How much more of a hope in the future does God have for them? And it, when I read that last, and I was reading this last night, I was like, wow, that's amazing. God said this over such a sinful people. Imagine what he would do for people that are in sin, but that just don't get it yet. Now, all of this is not dependent on their response, but it's dependent on ours to God. It's on us saying, God, here I am, send me. Because if we're not going to respond to God, who's going to go get him? It's dependent on us. People need to be shown the love of Jesus, or they won't know what they're buying into. They won't know what they're getting. If they don't see it exemplified in their lives, they're not going to want to even touch it. And I'm sure you've seen it at work or at school, wherever you're at. People don't want it. They don't want it just because you say it. They want it because you live it. It's His love that changes them. It's our obedient response to join with Him in this process that enables us to bring his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. It's about them. As we are obedient and we join in with God with what he's doing, we get, we see God and we start, all right, Lord, where are you? Where's that heartbeat? Do -do -do -do. Where is it? I hear it. It's somewhere. And once we learn and we connect with that heartbeat of God and we understand it and we become obedient to what he tells us to do, and I would venture to say that most of what God will tell us to do will not look spiritual. I thought the, the funny line of, was it two Sunday nights ago, Rob Stearns, the last line he had was, you know, maybe maybe the most spiritual thing you could do for someone is to go um, make them a, a pot roast. And it is so true. It is so true. That may be one of the most spiritual acts you can do. And... Um, I, I believe that we are called to be a people in this church, in this fellowship. People for people. Our love for people is strong. I want people to be able to come into here and feel the love of God through you. I, want the, I don't want anyone to ever come into this place and feel like, ah, I don't belong. Eh, nobody really likes me. I want people to come in here and feel like, man, I am loved. I am desired. Why? Because God desires them. He's passionately desiring for them we should be passionately desiring for them too. And our hearts should go out to them and when they come in, we need to surround them. So I'll tell you what, there are people and you would, you'd be like, no, not in today's day. There are people who you start showing them that kind of love, they'll be like, man, no one ever showed me that before. I had a, I had a kid who, um, Sadie and I were leading a youth group uh, several years back. And this was a kid who professed to be homosexual. And you know, he, a friend had invited him, and he's like, oh, they're not going to want me there because of who I am. And through the friend, we said, no, we want him here. We really want him here. Very strongly, but we really do. So she told him, and he's like, okay. He's like, well, and then they text us, and like, well, we're going to be here early this week. And we're like, all right, well, that's cool, because they had a bus schedule that got him there early. And we had extra dinner sitting on the stove. And we had just gotten done, and we were going to actually put it away. And they walk in the door. And we looked at him, and we're like, you hungry? And he's like, yeah, I, well, I didn't have dinner. Yeah, I'm kind of hungry. I'm like, here, here's a plate. Go grab some stuff off the stove. His, and, and this is so simple. His, his jaw hit the floor. Seriously, he looked at me, and he's like, you serious? I'm like, why not? 
He's like, don't you know I'm gay? I'm like, I don't care. He's like, nobody's ever done that for me. And I sat there and I walked in the living room and I kind of scratched my head and I'm like, really? Really? No one showed you that kind of love ever? Like, as a Christian? I'm like, that, that's, that's sad. That's sad. And my heart is that people would know the love of God through us. That it would be so strong. Because I'll tell you something. The presence of God is amazing. It is awesome. But there's nothing. The Bible says that his love is what breaks the yoke of bondage. And if his love is supposed to be exemplified through us, then it's the love that comes through us that will cause their hearts to be broken for Christ. So no matter what season you're in for someone, you might be the person who's sowing the seed. You might be the person who's watering. You might be the person who's reaping. It's okay to be in any one of those three as long as you're doing it. Let's let the Holy Spirit be the one that draws and, and does it ultimately. And, and let's let the Holy Spirit be the one that convicts people. You know? Let's let, let the Holy Spirit be the one through our lives and, and through the way we live, through the exemplary life we live, that He shows people where they're going wrong. And that through our love, Christ comes into their heart and changes them. And um, that is where my heart is. And I'm, I know there's much more, and I don't want to keep going on because I don't want it to be drawn, drawn out. You know, it could get really long if I... Because this is a passionate moment that I have very strongly. And I will tell you that because of the, what I've walked through, I have a very strong passion for widows and orphans. I have a very strong passion for that. And... Um, I, I've seen a lot of injustice and my heart is for God's justice to be brought to us the people. Not because they deserve it, because God's justice is not about deserving, but because His grace is about it and that His justice is shown to them that we show the love of God because of His justice for their lives. And um, that's what I wanted to share this morning. I hope it came across in the heart and the spirit that I wanted it to, that we become a church about people that we become a church that has a heartbeat for people. And um, from knowing most of you, I know that that's your heart too. And um, that's why it kind of excites me to see who's actually been coming to this because I'm just, I feel like, as we've been sharing this with people, I feel like we're getting fueled right now. I feel like the Lord's putting in the premium high-octane jet fuel and he's loading it up and he's, he's getting close to brimming it off. And once it gets brimmed off, he's going to uh, light the match at the bottom and we're just going to watch. And it's going to be incredible to see what God does. And I'm really excited for that. So thank you for being obedient to come. And for those of you who are here just visiting, thank you for coming as well and uh, blessing us by being here today. All right. Well, let's close in prayer. Lord, I thank you for today, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be people about your work for people. And I pray, Lord God, that you would cause us to catch your vision, your heart. Not just for, you know, knowing you. And not just for knowing your heart for the people in the church. But also as a well, Lord God, for the people that do not dwell in these walls. The people that don't know you. The people that are hurting. The people that are dying. Lord, let us not let another Jamie Rodemeyer happen without us going and grabbing. At least throwing your word into the situation at least showing your love. I pray, Lord God, that you cause us as your people to be people of action, not of people sitting on pews or sitting on seats or just waiting and waiting and waiting. Let us, Lord God, get your vision, grow in it, and then take off with it, Lord God, and do what you called us to do, Lord God. Each and every one of us, because, Lord, each of us is called to lead in some way. Each of us is called to do something incredible for God. Let us not sell ourselves short, Lord God, for the lies of the enemy that tell us, oh, you're a nothing. Oh, it's never going to happen for you. But I pray, Lord God, that we would stand in faith and in boldness and say, no, this is my time. This is my season. And I will not bend and I will not break. But I'm going forward and I will accomplish everything God has for me. Lord, use this church to take back land and, and take back territory that the enemy thought he had stolen and thought he won. But little does he know he's in for a surprise because we're here to take it back. And we're here to take back every life that has been affected. And we just thank you for that. Bless your people today, Lord God, as we go. Bless our time of fellowship. And I pray, Lord God, that you would just start bubbling up inside of us vision and passion and excitement for you. 
In Jesus' name. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and grant you his peace. And you're going out greater than when you came in. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in the peace of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, have a blessed week. Thank you for coming.